Hi everyone, welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Stephanie Valdez and I'm the co-owner of the bookstore. Tonight, we've partnered with our friends at Two Lines Press and Center for the Art of Translation. Jordan Stump and Imani Perry join us to discuss Stump's new translation of That Time of Year by Marie Ndaye. While the pandemic has taken a toll on every facet of our lives, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become a bright spot for the book world during months of quarantine. Thank you to Jordan, Imani, and, for, and all of you for your time and attention this evening. And now for some housekeeping, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. If you have a question, please click on the Q&A button there at the bottom of the screen to submit it. We'll try to get through as many questions as we can at the end of the program. You'll also find a chat button at the bottom where I'll be posting links to purchase the book, as well as donations links to support our ongoing virtual programming. A caveat for tonight's event, we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections. So please bear with any technical issues that might arise. We'll try to solve them quickly. Our virtual series continues through the fall, so please head over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. One that I'll mention, next Wednesday, we'll be featuring another of Jordan Stump's translations. This time, Scholastique Mukasanga joins us to present her new collection, Igafu, in conversation with Mar Martha Cooley. Let me introduce tonight's presenters and we'll get started. Jordan Stump is one of the leading translators of innovative French literature. The recipient of numerous honors and prizes, he has translated books by Nor Nobel laureate Claude Simon, Jean-Philippe Toussaint, and Eric Chevalliard, as well as June's, Jules Verne's French language novel, The Mysterious Island. His translation of Ndaye's My Friends was short, All My Friends was shortlisted for the French American Foundation Translation Prize. Amani Perry is Hughes Rogers Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University and a faculty associate with the programs in Law and Public Affairs, Gender and Sexuality Studies, and Jazz Studies. She is the author of six books, including Looking for Lorraine, The Radiant and Radical Life of Lorraine Hansberry, Vexy Thing on Gender and Liberation, More Beautiful and More Terrible, The Embrace of Transcendence of Racial Inequality in the United States, among others. Her most recent book is Breathe, A Letter to My Sons, which was a finalist for the 2020 Chautauqua Prize and a finalist for the NAACP Image Award for Excellence in Nonfiction. And now I'll turn it over to our guests. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Jordan. Hello, Imani. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Fine. Thank you. Well, um, I, I wanted to begin by thanking you. Um, you know, as I will say that as a reader, um, reading novels in translation is one of the most important things for me. And I have learned both from being able to read some novels in, in two languages, once in Spanish and, um, but also many in translation, that it's an, it's an incredible both art and skill. And so I, 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 I want to thank you both for this novel, but for the work that you do broadly. Um, and maybe we can begin by talking a little bit about the content, and then I would love to talk to you about the process for you. Um, so um, we begin with a man, Herman, who is a Parisian who is in his country home in a village, um, and his wife and child have disappeared. And then there's sort of um, this kind of Kafka's journey, um, trying to discover them, but also um, be, find where they are, but also this encounter with what it means to be in the village off season, class, cos cosmopolitanism, surveillance. I mean, it's just, a, it's, it's both other, otherworldly, but also deals with a lot of very familiar issues, right? Right. Yeah, can you talk about it? Surely, I mean, it's, it's funny. I mean, the, the, the way that this novel uh, was born for Jaya was that she had just moved to uh, a small town in Normandy <clears throat> that gets a lot, of, uh, a lot of visitors from Paris and from, um, from Great Britain. And um, when September came, 
and traditionally all the Parisians go back to Paris, she noticed this strange change about the village, that suddenly there's not this life around, there's not this kind of, as she says, this kind of slightly artificial, but still agreeable uh, agitation and, you know, bus busyness that, um, that comes with tourists. And so it starts with that very um, prosaic little moment. And um, she sort of took that, um, that plain little scenario and turned it into this story that is indeed, as is so often the case with Ndiaye, it's, it's kind of a, kind of a comedy. I mean, this is actually one of her funnier books. Um, it's kind of a horror story, though not exactly. Um, it's kind of a statement about French society. And then, um, and then come all these other layers that, uh, that one, I think, often wonders when one is reading, is this actually what's it, what it's about? Or is this not exactly what it's about? That's particularly in her earlier works, Jaya shines at that uh, wonderful skill of giving you a book that might be an allegory for something, and you're never quite sure, should I be reading this as an allegory? You could see it as a, um, you know, about assimilation, the, the need to assimilate to, you know, a dominant culture when you're not, etc. And, and it's that, and it's not that at the same time. And that's one thing I love about Jai is that she is continually challenging the reader, really, and my students often uh, say this when we're reading her books, that, um, um, you have to sort of keep wondering, what is it that she's trying to say here? What is it that this is actually about? And that's my favorite kind of writing, to kind right. of really quite understand what's going on. Yeah, I mean, it, and and to do so with, and I'm, I'm just um, sort of stunned by, I'm, I'm a big fan of her work, to do that with, with the kind of spareness of her work. Right, so that it does, to be able to, to have, I mean, even if you just you think about gender, if you think about you know national identities, if you, without having all of these explanatory, right, um, words, but you can recognize it, right. So what part of what happens is, here is what the ostensibly sophisticated um, Parisian who has to learn the codes of the village and the relations of power that are presumed have have flipped, right? And, and he has to, you know, we often think of sort of the, the, the rural person as, as, as unsophisticated, as not knowing how to read the environment, but in fact, that's precisely the opposite and he's at the mercy right. of the villagers. And at the same time, he is, he very quickly, uh, I mean, this is, this is where the assimilation uh, story becomes more complicated because he very quickly decides, this is wonderful. This is the kind of life that I would like to live forever, just in this constant rain and not thinking about anything, not really, you know, just kind of uh, wandering from day to day uh, and, and losing, I can't remember the words that she uses, but, you know, all mental... Uh, acuity or something like that. He, he sort of feels himself being, being, being dragged down to this level of, um, of um, well, I don't like the words dragged down. He feels himself becoming this new person and one could read that as a kind of a violation, but he is in love with it. Right, right. And even the question, and, and even love and desire are transformed, right? I mean, he sort of took this ease with which it, it is, it's funny, she's such a, a, a very different writer from Morrison, but because I, um, I'm teaching Toni Morrison's Beloved next week, I also kept thinking about this question of the ghastly and not, and, and other world presences and even, you know, the, 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 the beauty of that not sort of being clearly articulated, there's not a clear answer, but it actually then allows for you to think about all of the different ways that there are presences in our life, right, that we can't, we don't completely make, can't make, completely make sense of, right? With yeah. Actually, an interesting, you know, so this is an earlier book. This is from uh, 1994. And in her later books, like uh, La Divine, um, she, she sort of um, go, takes another approach where there's a lot of analysis of what's going on in somebody's head, you know, really page after page after page. 
uh, and and yet, and yet the 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 effect of that ends up being very much the same. I have all this sort of very detailed, convoluted dive into uh, the into what's going on in the minds of Clarisse, in the mind of Clarisse Bellier or or of La Divine herself, and yet you you still feel like I still feel like there's thousands of things not being said here that oh, I have. Yeah. The there, yeah. Where she goes, right. Yeah. Where, yeah. <laughs> right. I, I love that, that. That's a wonderful book. Yeah. Um, and do you, I mean, I'm wondering, because this is an earlier book, I'm, I'm interested if you could talk a little bit about the, the, the reaction to this one as opposed to the later. That's a really good question. It's, you know, in France, uh, she has been a star for a long time. And, um, and, and yet, a, um, an, a, 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 um, not a comfortable position as a star. She's adored by the critics generally. If you look, I'm always fascinated to see what just regular readers think about books. And on the French equivalent of Goodreads, which is called Babelio, um, um, sort of ordinary French readers have a very, I don't know, jaundiced view of her. They tend to think that she's too talky, uh, too too vague, um, too precisely the things that we like about it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, just essentially feeling uh, like like um, she asks something of the reader that that many readers are not really willing to give. Um, her earlier works were like this one. Um, were less, shall we say, controversial. Um, by the time you got to uh, Three Strong Women or La Divine, um, the, the attitude among many French readers seems to be a little more um, almost resentful, I mean, among the worst of them, resentful that this person is asking me uh, to, read, to read all this, to understand all this. Um, now that's, that's a subset of French readers, obviously. Um, in this country, um, she's, you know, her very, the very first book of hers that was ever translated was a wonderful book called uh, En Famille, which was translated as Among Family um, and went nowhere in this. Uh, in this country. <clears throat> I think the next one was Rosica. That was early 2000s, I think. Also kind of disappeared. Um, it's really uh, thanks to um, my excellent friends whom I've never met at uh, Two Lines Press uh, for um, giving these books that I've been doing um, such a good home and such good, um, you know, sort of good, such a good airing among the American public. Um, People are people are slowly catching on, but um, you know there's a long history in this country of writers who are big stars in France who nobody here cares about. Modiano was a massive star in France, and uh, and nobody I translated one of his books that went nowhere. Nobody read, nobody wanted to do any other ones, and then he got the Nobel Prize, and suddenly everybody loves Modiano. <laughs> And uh, it's, it's a kind of a sim similar feeling with this. It's like you have a really great talent here who really should be um, a, uh, um, a sort of major figure on the world literary stage. And in this country, at least, I feel like there's, there is, they're slow, we've, we've been slow to catch up. I agree. And I, you know, I, I, I the way that I, I've read it initially, and I, I, you know, this, I don't know how much this is central to it, but that, um, I mean, for me, reading her work has been profound because uh, for many reasons, I think it's beautiful, but also the way that she talks about difference um, is I find uh, and is so nuanced and so and, and purpose, right? the sort of very sort of sensory elements, the emotional elements, the anxieties, the desires. Um, but I also think that, that in this national context, it's very hard for a writer who is identified as black to talk about difference in a way that isn't sort of prescribed, right? It isn't, um, from regardless of where in the world they're from, right? And so I, I've often wondered if that um, was a, of um, some of the resistance because from the moment, you know, I, I read Rosie Carr first, but I just, you know, fell in love with her. Yeah. Yeah, what a wonderful book. And I do think, I mean, she, uh, she's, again, in the earlier works, and I think this is an example, 
Um, she likes to tease the reader a little bit with um, the question of um, the, the race of her characters. You know, she never really explicitly says this person is black or white or anything else. Um, La Sorciere is a really great book, never been translated, The Witch. Uh, and um, it's, there's all these little, you know, signifiers in the text that tell you this person is white. And there are all these little signifiers in the text that tell you this person is black. And she will never tell you. And so she sort of puts the reader into the slightly uncomfortable position of, of asking themselves, well, what, you know, what is the color of this person's skin? <laughs> without knowing that which is right yeah what is what's your process um when you are translating a work in terms of your relationship with the author and how you you know my main process is um <laughs> um constant constant rethinking of what i'm doing um i always do i do a very quick first draft this isn't terribly unusual. A very quick first draft, and then um, I, and then that's you know that might take a couple of months maybe, and then go and then for a year uh, try revising, and um, I try to revise in as many ways as I possibly can, uh, which is to say, first word to the last word. I usually try to go backwards to the last page, and then the next to the last page, and I also try to do um, all the pages of the text in random order. All of that has to do with the way that, in my opinion, a book exists, which is that it's a story in time. It starts here and ends there. And it's also a collection of sentences. And um, it exists in both of those different ways, a collection of pages. And so I think that the translation, uh, the act of, the, you know, the act of translating thing should take that into account. And then sometimes I compare that to the, compare my translation to the original, sometimes I don't. All the time I'm thinking, what does this author sound like? What does this character sound like? What is a sentence that I can imagine this author writing in English? What is a sentence that I can? One of the very last things I do, this is in a way the most important part, is that I have uh, my wife, uh, Eleanor Harden, reads the uh, the translation to me aloud while I follow along in the original to see if it's, you know, have I gone too far? Is it making sense? And then also um, she has a, she has a wonderful ear for telling me uh, what's, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, and so there again, you know, I'm sort of thinking about all the ways in which a book exists. It's a bunch of pages that are only in my head in which I'm looking at. It's also something which exists for a reader and that you have to think about that reader who hasn't, hasn't read the book in the original, et cetera. So it's, I mean, that's not a terribly glamorous process. It's, um, it's um, a lot of, a lot of rethinking. And the, and the main question is, what does this, what, given the fact that um, Ndiaye is not an English speaking writer, uh, her, her, what she does is very French, very, she uses all of the grammatical complexities of French to write these wonderful looping sentences, which we don't necessarily have. So she's not, she's not, she's never going to write like an English speaking writer. And my very difficult job is to figure out what, what would she sound like, I guess, if she were. Um, and that's, that's hard. In terms of work with the author, um, it depends a lot. There are authors who, uh, I, I'm a fan, first of all, I'm a fan. So for me, one of the great thrills in translating is simply being able to get in touch with the writer and to be able to talk. Uh, that's, that is a, a glorious moment for me. Um, some writers, uh, I always ask questions. I always have a few questions to ask. Um, some writers are very helpful, some aren't. Um, some, some have become sort of friends of mine and some remain more or less at a distance. Uh, the, the, I, Yes, somewhere inside me, I don't particularly like the idea of the of the translator and the author as collaborators. They've done something. My job is to tell people what it is that I saw when I saw that thing. It's not quite the same thing as the two of us writing a book together. Um, but at the same time, I can't imagine translating an author whom I, uh, whose work I love and not at some point or another um, trying to get them in some way or another uh, to, to reflect on what it is that I found and to tell me to what degree that corresponds to what they saw when they were writing it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you, does with um, Marie Inyai in particular, um, 
because she has such a, I mean, it's a, you know, and I, I read her work in your translation and, and uh, does she have, do you, you know, do you bring the, the voice that she already, you already know that she has, does it have bearing on the sub, you know, on the later translation, for example, because she translated some of her works before, do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Or, or is it really just a fresh exercise, even if you... Oh, I see. No, 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 absolutely, absolutely. A great luxury of translating several books by a person is that it's, uh, you start to, you know, it takes a long time to understand a voice. Uh, even um, when I, when I'm, when I'm translating the book, you know, I, uh, the first draft, I feel like I really haven't begun to understand how to translate it until I've done the last page. And that's only the beginning, and uh, and so that goes from from book to book as well. Um, the the very first time I tried to translate in Jaya uh, was, I, I I had taught um, a book of verse called um, Mon Coeur à l'Étoile, which became my heart hemmed in, in a contemporary literature class, and I'd admired her work for years, but I'd never tried to translate it. And I and having finished that book, I thought, okay, I'm going to do this book. I'm going to translate this book. And so I sat down and I did about five pages and it was so horrible. It was so awful. I just told myself, forget it. I can't do this. I can't, this is no good. Forget it. Um, and it was, and, and then um, I sort of happened on to another little book, uh, Autoportrait en Vert, Self-Portrait in Green. And I thought, all right, I'm going to try again. And this time I'm not going to quit. And I didn't have a publisher or anything. I just translated it all. Then, okay, well, slowly I am figuring this out. And so then I went on to do uh, To Mes Amis, which became All My Friends, uh, and, and again, slowly figuring it out. Thankfully, at that moment, uh, I got an email from this, from Two Lines Press, who said, do you happen to, we're looking for new projects, do you have anything to offer? And so I sent them that, and they said, yes, and this was, and, but, um, but every book is at the same time a brand new struggle. What is the voice in this book? And at the same time, there is, there is, a, you know, a history to that voice and you can kind of, you, that history really strongly influences the way that I read, you know, and the way that I think about the words in the book that I'm doing currently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that's really interesting. Also, I was one of the questions that, um, and I, I, we're going to turn to, to questions soon, so just want to invite people to continue to ask questions in the chat, and we see them, we'll, we'll start to... Sure. Um, but one of the things I've often thought about, and this is partially because I, um, years ago I taught, I taught law school, and one of the things that is interesting about law is that it depends upon translation for, for court transcripts, but oftentimes what you really need is an interpreter, right? Um, in the sense of sort of having a, a dynamic interaction to get the sense of meaning, right? Um, but it sounds like for literary translation, that is sort of the process itself, is that there's a sort of dynamism to it, right? Do you um, find yourself sort of as a literary critic as you're in the process of translating? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's inseparable. Um, because um, at every moment, I mean, this this is a fairly you know this is an anodyne example, but but um, somebody says you know il fait beau, it's a nice day. Um, there are many ways to translate uh, il fait beau, right? And all of that depends on who's speaking, what the context is, what kind of a person is this, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, at no moment are you simply looking at the words, saying, okay, I'll just get this words, right? I mean, you are always thinking about what is what is what is what do these words mean for this character? What do these words mean for this narrator? What do these words mean for this author? What do these words mean for this literary tradition in which the uh, in which the author is writing? It's um, it is an incredibly intense form of interpretation. I mean, of sort of literary critical interpretation. Um, just as law, for instance, you know, I've always thought law is really. Um, I've had I have many law students who take take uh, French classes and translation classes because that's a place where language. You know, you have to get signifier and signified to actually, you know, work together and, and be ambiguous. How the hell do you do that? And, uh, and it's, it's um, I, I think, you know, ordinary literary criticism, which I've done some, of which I've done some, um, is, I don't know, this is a facetious thing to say, but, but you, get to, you get to decide what it is that you're going to see, right? Yeah. But in translation, you don't get to decide. you got to see it all. And you got to get other people to see it. Mm-hmm, uh mm-hmm. -huh. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Do you think that there's something, this is sort of like a leading question, but um, 
um, about, I, I mean, I think about American readers. Is there something that becomes available with reading literature and translation? I don't mean just with the authors, but actually as, a, as both an intellectual exercise and aesthetic experience that, that is of particular value. I think one of the the things of most value for an American reader is to shatter this shell that 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 it exists around us as American speakers of a hegemonic language and members of a hegemonic culture, uh, for whom essentially um, the whole world pays attention to what we do. We don't pay attention to what they do, uh, and anything um, anything worth reading, for instance, has probably already been written in English. And translation is, reading translations is a nice little, you know, piquant kind of uh, um, um, spice that you put on top of all that. But but these people, you know, they're, if, if they're not really, they're not writers in the way that are, yeah, as a, in the same way that people make fun of, I don't know, pop music from other cultures. They don't, just not so much anymore, but that used to happen. But uh, the real stuff is what we do. And then other people imitate us or else we don't pay attention to it because it's weird. Uh, and I think that um, uh, for an American to to have that shell broken uh, is is not only uh, a good thing; it's uh, it's it's vital uh, to to uh, as a way of as a way of um, breaking us out of a kind of a of a of a place of privilege that we have been that we that we grew up in that we don't realize is also a prison. Um, so I want to turn to some of the questions that have been And one is um, that I want to know the answer to. You mentioned that Las Sociedades has translated into English. Would you consider translating it? And also, how do you choose which works? <laughs> I would never turn down the opportunity to translate a book by Marine Jai. I don't care what it is. Uh, her very first book, uh, Comédie Classique, uh, is, is uh, one sentence. She's she, she's not interested in having all her older books translated, but I, I would I would do that one I guess. But I would never turn down the opportunity. She's it's always a it's just a, the experience of tangling with those words, um, of her her very um, distinctive way of thinking and of putting a sentence together. It's I think in all the translation that I've done, it's this, it's it's her work is the one that's meant the most to me and that I felt sort of what's good for me, I don't know, in some way, translating her work. So I would absolutely do it. Um, I pick books um, because uh, I love them. And if, if I don't love it, I don't do it. Um, that's, that's um, I don't, you know, frankly, uh, there's, there's a, I think, from my point of view, at least a kind of a misapprehension about translators that they're sort of public servants, that I'm sort of giving this stuff to you and aren't I a good person because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm making this stuff available. That's not how it is for me at all. I'm a very, very, very selfish person. I, I translate because I get to not just read the book, not just look at it, but actually be a part of it in a sense, be a part of how it, how it means, how it makes meaning. Um, that's, that is a, um, a feeling that's in a purely egotistical, purely self-centered, um, um, self-absorbed way I love. And so I can't imagine I've, I've translated students transcripts before and I don't have anything to love about students transcripts and so I can dutifully put the words together but translating a book that's a different thing so I love it that's that's the only the only criteria um, can you talk about how self-portrait in green came about as I understand it, I have a, I have a, I, I don't have a, a, a long story about that, but she was, there was a company, uh, there was a, a publisher, Mercure de France, who uh, was um, at a, for a time publishing memoirs and was approaching famous people uh, and asking them to write memoirs. And this is, I can't remember who, who else did this. One was a, was a fashion designer, I don't know, was it Christian Dior, somebody like that. Um, and, you know, sort of big, you know, sort of uh, um, public celebrities. And then they had this idea, well, why not Marine Jai? She's, a, uh, she's an interesting person. Let's see, let's see, let's see what her memoir would look like. <laughs> and then she gives us this thing that I don't know what it is. Is it, is it a memoir? Is, how are you supposed to read this? 
uh, and um, I've I've never you know we write I've uh, I've, I've never asked her I've never dared to ask her what what is it that you're trying to say in self portrait in screens but I think it's it's again it's that being half half this half that that's the person who speaks in in self portrait in green is got to be her. Uh, her husband bears the same name as her real husband. The place that she lives is exactly the place that Njai, one of the places that Njai lived. Um, her children, exactly the same age, et cetera. So it's definitely her, but, um, but uh, and I'm willing to believe, I don't, th I don't think there's you know, some sort of an auto fiction thing going here. I'm willing, entirely willing to believe that this question of greenness and of, of um, other people in green, um, is, a, is, is part of the way that she sees the world in part because the, that connection of a color and a, and a mood comes up in other books like in like yellow in uh, uh, what you call? Um, so it's somewhere there is there is that is she is in there but it's just hard to know what underneath what and inside of what is the part that is the actual memoir part and that's I mean it is a really it's a it's a wonderful provocation, right, to the idea of memoir. Yeah. It's just, I'm going to tell you the third person story. I'm going to show you, I'm going to share with you my imagination, which is a different, yeah. That's right. Um, Maybe that's the truest memoir there is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, oh, uh, okay. Seeing as the time is often out of joint in Ndiaye's books, I'm wondering if you could talk a little more about the experience of translating one of her earlier novels after having worked on so many of her later books. Did it illuminate some sort of progression? Why your later work in books that's, a, that's a complicated answer. Ask for a complicated answer. Um, in a way, speaking of time being sort of, you know, uh, displaced, I remember reading this book when it first came out. I remember it very distinctly. Uh, I have been reading her books since, since the early 90s, and I remember when this one came out. And uh, I remember thinking, as I often thought when I read those early works before I was translating her, thinking, well, I read a lot of books that I sort of get, and then this one I feel like I'm not sure. And yet the, the certain images of it, the ribbons that the women wear, um, obviously a few other ones that I'll bring out, that I will leave out uh, to, so as not to spoil anything, um, just sort of stuck in my mind. And so when I finally had the chance to go back and translate this book that I'd loved 20 years before, um, it, was, it was like going back to a place, going back to something that I had had and had, had lost and was able to have again. At the same time, it's really interesting to me, having translated her most recent books, um, going back and seeing this thing that was from 20 years before, seeing, oh, this, I see how this turns into something else in her recent books. Uh, and I see how that, the voice that she has now is already there, but it's in a different form. But I can see there is, there is a, there is a, there's a definite continuity at the same time as there's a rupture. She sees um, a, a pretty big rupture between her recent books and her older books. In fact, when when the possibility of translating this book came up, when the translating when the possibility of translating one of her older books came up, I wrote her and said, "Which one of your earlier books do you think would make a good translation?" And uh, she said, "Oh, none of them. Don't do any of them. There, there's no interest. Uh, who, who cares?" It's that was that was so long ago. It doesn't mean anything. And so she clearly sees that. I think probably since uh, Three Strong Women, she sees herself almost as a different writer. And so it's that's also a little thing that I have to think about in my head too, because you know I don't want to don't want to deform her, her right. I mean her her work. But if she thinks that her work has a recent work, then. It's a little presumptuous of me to say, okay, well, I'm just going to force this earlier one uh, on you and on the American people. But at the same time, I loved it, right? And so um, love kind of overcame scruples. Well, you know, it's interesting because one of the things that, um, and I'm always trying to talk to my students about this, if you, if you read most authors over time, it, even you can find the seeds of the later work almost always, even if they're not fully elaborated. And one of the questions was about whether um, you know, the writers writing speaks 
socio-political issues critical at this moment. And because so much of the writing is about intergenerational moments, gender dynamics, right? It's, it feels incredibly pertinent, even if you're not entirely sure about sort of the exact moment in history that she's talking about, these questions of sort of the presumptions of earlier generations or tradition versus, you know, you know, cosmopolitanism, even within this novel, right? The, the, the ribbons that identify you know, one's marital status as a woman in the village, right? But, you know, it, you, and which are funny, but are also, you know, are like pantyhose, right? I mean, right, there's, which, you know, all of these, so there are always these questions that have everything to do with how we struggle through social transformation, power relations, right? I mean. Absolutely, absolutely. One of the, one of the, a read, some reader of this book on Goodreads or something like that said, you know, this, uh, there's no cell phones. And so that's, that's, um, that sort of gives it a timeless quality. It never even occurred to me. But I think that, that, that <laughs> there is that, that time. I mean, it could easily have been a book, I, th I think, written two years ago, because I mean, the things that she's talking about, it's not as if that's, Right, that's that's still as pertinent as it ever was, and still, and and what she has, what she sort of um, does with it is uh, is is a con it, it, there's a definite continuity with the earlier works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you um, who have a sense of as her are her are her greatest influences or her main influences? Um, she is very fond of Joyce Carol Oates. That interesting. I remember when I, I first saw that uh, she answered a quiz somewhere, and I saw that, and I thought, "What?" And then I thought, oh, yes, "I can see that. I can actually really see that." Um, she is also, as as writers of her age would be, strongly influenced by Kafka, not of her age, Kafka, Beckett, and oh. then, yeah, very clearly, right. And then uh, also the new novel. Uh, of the of the 1950s, Robrier, um, Duras, uh, people like that. It's um, there is you know she writes she wrote in those days for um, a publisher called Edition de Minuit, which is which were the people who brought the new novel out, and also Beckett in France, uh, it's long time home of the French avant garde, and so sort of writing uh, for Minuit for this this storied uh, publishing house. 40 years after its glory days, a lot of those mean rewriters in those days, uh, you could still really strongly fee feel this influence of the other mean re novel, the mean re novel from the 1950s. But I think to me, not having asked her the question, um, it's, it's very clear that Kafka is a big part of it. That's interesting, right, and you can, right, you can feel the, the, the Kafka ask, but, but but not in any way feeling derivative, right? I mean, this sort of, right, the kind of, um, kind of alienation, the terror, the horror, but, uh, but there's, uh, she has an intimacy that feels very different. Yes, yeah, she is. Uh, she, nobody writes like that. Yeah. She, has, she has a voice that is so, that is so, a voice in a sort of worldview that is so entirely her own. Um, it's, uh, that's, that's why, I mean, in a sense, the, um, the, the notion of, uh, this is a non-scholarly thing to say, but uh, I don't really think very much about influences, you know, it's like she is, she is a, a rule unto herself, and, uh, and so it's, her world is incredibly self-contained, and her voice is incredibly self-possessed. Uh, and it's not that it doesn't owe anything to other people who doesn't, but uh, but she has she f forges she forged uh, and continues to forge um, a, uh, a a genre which is like only her own. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Yeah. Let's do two. Yeah. So one is, um, what sorts of things do you typically wind up asking? When you're translating a book of hers, and how interested is she in how she's translating? So I think actually one of the, one of the first questions I asked her was in um, uh, for all my friends. There's a character who was who's a teacher, and he was talking about one of his students, and he always called him the Maghrebin, 
uh, the person from the Maghreb, the person from French speaking North Africa. And I thought, boy, that's, that's, that means something to a French person, but I can't just say the Maghrebine, right? It isn't going to mean anything. And so uh, I agonized over that. And I wrote her and I said, what can I call, what can I have him call this person? And there she was very helpful. She said, uh, look, this guy's kind of a jerk. Uh, let's say that he just calls his student the Arab. It's good enough and close enough. Um, so uh, most of the often questions that I ask are, are pretty basic like that. Like, if there's a cultural difference, how can I bridge that cultural difference? And very, very often um, my questions are, what does this mean? I don't understand the sentence. Just explain, <laughs> explain the sentence to me because I'm not getting it. Uh, and um, she is, uh, I think of, of pretty much all the authors whom I've translated, she is the least expansive. Uh, she's not interested generally in debating things very much. Uh, and in um, uh, um, sort of, you know, trying to, although the first example that I gave is, is a counter example, but, but she's not, she's, she's, she's pretty hands off as a writer, uh, as a, you know, vis-a-vis -vis a translator, not really interested in getting her, getting her, putting her, her hands in the dough, as they say in French. Um, extremely friendly uh, and, and everything, but, um, but she seems to um, see the work of the translation as the work of the translator and not something that she is, I don't know if it's um, on any, for any particular ideological reason, but she just sort of avoids getting involved with it. Mm -hmm. Time I sent her questions and she said I'll answer them and she forgot to answer them entirely. So that tells you how. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> um, oh, and this is as a final question. Well, maybe I'll ask one very short one after. Mm -hmm. But, um, but um, which is about how the, her novels have been received by her students. <laughs> um, generally, well, the later books, students complain that they're too long. <laughs> um, this book, I taught this book uh, just uh, just uh, last, last fall, I think, or previous spring, I guess. And, um, and that was actually the best reaction that I've ever had. Students were really intrigued. Is the, it takes them a little while. You have to remember, these are third, fourth year students who's connection with the language and with the culture is, you know, it's, it's developing. It's not quite there yet. And so it's, they're, sometimes they're not quite sure what they're reading. Am I understanding this right? Sometimes uh, they're not quite sure why something means something, uh, you know, why something is significant, what cultural references are they not getting. The, the, the learning language, you know, the learning foreign language reader is in a tough spot. And there's so much that they have to, that they have to feel like, Somehow, if this isn't if this isn't doing what a book usually does to me, it's my fault. Once you sort of get over that, once you sort of get them to understand what exactly kind of a writer she is, this really happened last time I taught. Uh, um, that time of year, um, she uh, dans de saison in French. Uh, they were students were really kind of enthralled that this was like somebody told me. I didn't know there were books like this. And that's the, those are the words every professor loves to hear, right? <laughs> and so um, that's, there, obviously there are, uh, there are reasons why students find her difficult. To, and that that's raises all sorts of other questions for, you know, for students, that's how, how it is. But uh, when it connects and when you can sort of get them to understand why it's connecting in their mind, um, my students were really, really, really delighted. Um, I, I taught La Divine in a graduate seminar, I think, and um, they, you know, graduate students have a lot of work to do, and they were, you know, sort of going through the pages and so this is page, 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 page. That's a different kind of reaction. They didn't have time to do, but when they can, when they can, when they when they have the time, when their mind is in the right place, when they can, when you can sort of guide them into seeing it, um, she's she she really blows away, in my experience, uh, a young American reader. You know, it's it's so interesting that you say that because I know that there, and for, for some good reasons, there's been um, a push towards this, the spoken part of language learning, right? Um, and a kind of immersion experience. But there's something that happens with the immersion in literature that is 
different in terms of your relationship with language, right? I mean, with figurative language, with suggestiveness, there's an aspect of sort of the, the, the deep way that language works, right? That they come. I agree so strongly about that. Yeah, that's, that's, I didn't really begin to understand French until I read, you know, Racine, for God's sake, and uh, um, it's, and, and, Beck, and Beckett in French uh, and, and others. It's like, it's, it is, it's, immersion is great, but it's, it's, a, it's frankly, it's a little bit like being, like being an American. It's a, it's a, it's a two-dimensional experience of language, you know, where it's just all oral and it's all right. Um, Writing is a third dimension, and it requires you um, to get out of the little two-dimensional word, world you've lived in comfortably and explore a three-dimensional world, like in that book, uh, Flatland. Uh, and um, that's, that is, it's, when it works, unbelievably exhilarating. And, and it changes the way that you appreciate the language and appreciate what can be done with the language and the imagination and everything else. Um, where would you suggest, I mean, in addition to that time, where would you have your new reader of Njaye begin? Such a good question. Um, chronologically, it doesn't make it, it is a nonsense to begin here because this is, after all, I think the earliest of her books that's been translated. No, um, uh, um, uh, Among Family, but that's long out of print, alas. Actually, that would be the perfect place to start. Um, this book that's, that was translated as Among Family, if you can find it. Um, that I think of as a kind of a foundational text. Um, a lot of, because of really one of her big concerns too is uh, is just, the mysteries of one's own family and how they change, often how they change for the worse, how they, you know, uh, um, exclude you, etc. And that that book is all about that. That's a little bit present in here as well. Um, and so that, if you can get among family, that would be the ideal place to start. Um, I have, so her famous, the most famous book, the one that got the Goncourt, is uh, is uh, Three Strong Women. Um, which uh, is all, would also be, you know, I mean, in, in a sense, that's a kind of a foundational text for her modern uh, writing. Um, and La Divine, I mean, I think La Divine is probably the most, is probably the richest of them all. Um, but I think it would be better to start with something a little, a, a little more aerated. <laughs> Uh, than La Divine. La Divine requires a deep dive. And um, I, I, I'm not coming up with a good answer here. Among oh. family, if you can get it. If not, I think, I, think this, I think that time of year is not a bad place to start. It's when La Divine is the, it's, it haunts my imagination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. Okay, very last question because several okay. And we really will sign off. And thank you so much. This was such a fantastic conversation. Thank um, you. The structure of the sentences is so unique stylistically. How does that vary from French to English? And then we'll put the Right. French can do a lot with word order, uh, with um, in relative clauses. French tolerates long sentences, much longer sentences than, you know, sort of ordinary French than um, our version of English uh, generally does. And um, it's, it, it allows the grammatical structure with, with um, you know, easily manipulable little relative pronouns like don, of which, or, you know, things like that, just in just a few words to turn the sentence in another, in just one word often, to turn the sentence in another direction. Uh, and where we, um, English grammar, I guess, I don't know if I'm going out on a limb here, English grammar, um, in, or at least um, current, con contemporary American vernacular English grammar, encourages a kind of a directness, a kind of the sentence begins here and ends there. And it's not just a question of the writer's voice, it really is a question of the way sentences work. You know, you have a verb, you know, subject verb, um, French French allows a lot more twistiness 
like, you know, that old story that everybody says about uh, Mark Twain, that he went to, he was reading a book in German and, and um, they asked him what he, or a play, I don't know, they asked him what he thought. And he said, well, I'm still waiting for the verb because, you know, German likes to put the verb at the end. Right. Of so French is a little bit like that too. You can, you don't, you don't have to have the sort of the, 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 the structure that immediately leads people from here to there uh, by the, by the surest route. Well, thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Imani. Thank you. We really appreciate having you. And um, we look forward to doing the deep dive and seeing what you translate next. And um, we'll be back maybe to talk about it. I'd be delighted. Thanks so much to everyone. And thanks to Two Lines Press. And uh, be well. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night.